All right, my friends, we are back Friday night. We're here to talk speaker talk with James Larson. How you doing, James? I'm good. Good, Gene. Thank you. So you got a, a tower. It's called the Philharmonic BMR or BR. I think it's BMR, right? BMR tower. BMR. Yeah. What does BMR stand for? Oh, boy. Uh, BMR. <laughs> I actually knew this at one point. Something something radiator it's a big uh, monitor radiator i don't know we should monitor. ask we should ask dennis that you know i just it's thought of review. that I, I think it's in my, the review of my first bmr monitor i um had but yeah it stands if anybody's for watching if anybody's watching right now go look at our home page look at the philharmonic bmr tower review james also did their bookshelf speaker and he allegedly put what the acronym bmr means if anybody could look that up while we're broadcasting, I'll um, show the comment if you could figure it out. And uh, But in the meantime, um, if anybody wants to see the complete review, it's on audioholics.com. I think it's the first article still on the page. I haven't posted anything new since then. But I wanted you to give a firsthand experience on this speaker because you talked very uh, favorably. Oh, someone just, Dennis is there. Okay. <laughs> the Yay. guy that designed it. Balance mode radiator. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Yes, Dennis, awesome. by the way, is the, the designer and the proprietor of Philharmonic Audio, which is the manufacturer of the speaker that we just reviewed. So thank you, Dennis, for chiming in. Yep, Dennis is a friend of the site. You know, he's he's been involved um, for many years now. You know, he originally started out doing work for the standards body for FTC, and that's kind of how I met him. He went to one of our... Back in 2008, I believe, the Audioholic State of the Union event that we had at Disney, and he came uh, to talk about amplifier measurements because we had audio precision there. So I've known Dennis a long time, and I was happy to see that he started designing speakers because I know the guy is very knowledgeable. I know in the past he's designed crossovers for other companies like Salk Sound and maybe a couple of other brands I'm not even sure of at the moment, but I was, great, I was uh, very relieved to see his designs measure as well as they look. And um, I want you to kind of talk a little bit about this tower versus the bookshelf speaker and what makes it so special and just, you know, your experience there. I have a slide presentation that you put together. I will share over here for everybody to take a look at. How long did you spend listening to these speakers? Oh, geez. Uh... Well, I, I, I didn't have these that long since they needed to go back for um, th uh, this. Uh, they're actually, right now, this pair is at Capital Audio Fest. There's an audio show going on and like at or around Washington, D.C. So if you're in the area, you can hear these very pair being uh, de demoed at that audio show um, that, that's happening from the 5th to the 7th. Right. So if, you, if you're around there, guys, go uh, go listen to these things. Um, I think see tomatoes, uh, Saturday. No, it's Friday, right? Yeah, Friday. So they'll, uh, that's going on to the seventh. So you have Saturday and Sunday to go hear them for yourselves if they're in their area. Yeah, I I list them quite a bit for the amount of time that I had them, and um, they sound great. You know, so they they look great and they sound amazing. So yeah, yeah, they look really cool. I mean, the nice radius edges on the cabinets, good finish work. Um, I was kind of curious why why didn't he put the bass driver lower down to the floor to reduce ground bounce? Is it is it the port that gets in the way that, or is there another reason why he didn't put that woofer lower down in the cabinet? Uh, the reason is because the, this is not a normal ported loudspeaker. It's a uh, mass loaded transmission line that uses like a uh, the dimensions of the in inter interior of the cabinet to like uh -huh. use uh like standing waves to the, its advantage so, it so it's like a quarter wave is it a quarter wave trans uh, transmission line i believe so so i think that like the yeah and you need the woofer at a certain point mounted at a certain point in the cabinet for the the right you know to take advantage of just the right waves in order to use those like standing waves to your advantage whereas you know in most and most loud, like a normal ported loudspeaker they just try to like get rid of those standing waves, right? Just to like, you know, average them out or do this or that. These um, uh, transmission line will try to use those waves to their advantage. Those, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of response that those creates. And, gotcha. that is, and so you need that, that those woofers mounted at a very particular point in the cabinet. Okay. So what is that, like an eight inch uh, woofer? 
Yeah, it's the eight inch scan speak revelator. One of one they have a bunch of different eight inch revelators. That's one of them. Yeah. Okay. And then the uh the, the tweeter is a ribbon that's the RAL, right? The R A A L. R A A L, yeah. I don't know how how to pronounce that RAL, RAL. <laughs> I don't think I no, whatever. You, you know you know what we mean, but um yeah, I don't know if you really pronounce it, but we have close up of it if you go a little bit more into the slideshow. Here's, yeah, I'm a close up. So this is just well here's the specs. So that yeah, that mid, those mid ranges are, are kind of small. What are those like three, four inch? I think they're two point fives or wow. threes. Yeah, no, but they're they're fine for mid ranges. Okay, the, the, those are uh, like I mean I don't want to put like there's there's close up, close ups of them a little more in, but they're almost like the the secret sauce of the speaker. There's no real secret secret sauce so just because everything works together beautifully. But I I think the the mid ranges are particularly special for these because okay that's a really nice tweeter right that ribbon tweeter is really nice and so is the the woofer they're really nice and they're very very pricey for that for, for what they're doing right. these tectonic bmrs are really really good but they're like 20 bucks a pop and so they, they can keep up with this ribbon and this woofer and you know a very they create a very nice response they're excellent excellent drivers and they prove that you don't need to spend a fortune to make, get this superlative performance that the speaker is, you know, doing. And, and it has expensive drivers, and it can achieve, uh, you know, the same thing with these uh, less expensive drivers all working together. So it's about the design as a whole rather than the drivers. You know, I mean, you want good drivers, but you don't need expensive ones. Is like like kind of the message. Right, right. I got you. So, I mean, it's got reasonable sensitivity for a tower. It's a little on the low side. Usually a, a speaker of that size, you see anywhere from like 88 to 90 dB. Sure, but, yeah. But these are pretty uh, pretty robust drivers. They can handle a lot of power, right? I don't know about a lot of power. <laughs> Depends on what you mean, a lot of power. I probably... A I couple would hundred be little, watts. And... Yeah, I think you could, you could probably put a couple hundred watts in this speaker. Um, and it'll get pretty loud. This speaker will be pr pretty loud. Um, I, I wouldn't get it if you're like a headbanger and you want to like you know go nuts. I mean, this is probably isn't the speaker for that, but it it definitely gets loud enough for like normal people, right? <laughs> normal like, people. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, regular people. Even if you even if you like a little on the louder side, these speakers can handle speakers can handle that for sure. But um. It's not like you know, it's like a gigantic like JTR speaker with a you know compression drivers and you know uh, it's, it's not, not going to do 140 dB. Yeah, it's not going to do 140 dB. But I think most people would be more than satisfied with the uh, dynamic range of the speaker. Yeah. So what's the deal with the Linkwitz Riley crossover? Does that just give you better phase response? Um, I know that that's a that's basically the kind of filters you see in base management on processors and stuff you know second order for the high pass fourth order for the low pass um yeah i just i guess they just make a good blend for this design uh for like you know phase and amplitude and everything um dennis really is the guy to ask i mean i i you know it, it adds up to a flat response so and and uh what the 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 Neat thing about this these crossover points, 850 to it's a wide range for a mid range driver. So this yeah, mid range driver yeah. is going up to like almost four kilohertz, right? So that that's just shows goes to show how good that mid range driver though is, despite its um, you know, an ex an expensive cost. It's twenty bucks a pop, but it can handle an extraordinary range. Well, that's one of the advantages of using a smaller driver like that too. If you used a six and a half, it probably wouldn't be able to yeah, extend the bandwidth that high without it no being. Way. Oh yeah. yeah, there's no way with the six and a half. Yeah. So the interesting thing about the spec here is that it's minus three dB point is twenty five hertz. That's unusually low for a tower of of with with a single eight inch driver like this. And I guess that some of that has to do with the fact that they're using the transmission line enclosure and the kind of woofer that works in the in that kind of enclosure. Because I usually see towers, you know, maybe have about a 35 hertz minus 3 db point so you're, you're extending down an extra 10 10 hertz or so in this tower that that's but that does come at the cost of sensitivity yeah but yeah it doesn't matter though because this speaker it can get loud and you might need to put a little bit more wattage into it to achieve the same loudness as a you know a, i guess an equivalent size tower speaker that doesn't have this kind of extension but this speaker has you know uh, extraordinarily low deep bass extension so like um it doesn't need a subwoofer. It don't. 
Well, that's what I found with like, I have the Revel F328s here and I was looking at them versus the Salon 2s. The Salon 2s have about a 10 hertz lower 3 dB point, but they're also about 3 or 4 dB less sensitive. So like you said, you're trading sometimes extension for sensitivity. Is it really, it's a balancing act. So a speaker like this is really, you could probably get away with playing this as a full range tower without adding subs to it. I mean, I think yeah, that's what I read in your review. Yeah, you could, no, no problem. I mean, if you really want the real deep bass and like uh like modern movies you know that they did under 20 hertz and it's not really the speaker for that but it can play those movies back they can catch most of the bass and these movies like most people be very happy the speaker plays like there's a lot of subs that's not playing as low as these speakers okay so like the speakers are really good i mean the the knee the knee of the low end response is like in the low 20s and, and there's a lot of subs that can't play that low. Oh, go back, go back a picture, go back. There's a funny thing about this picture. Keep back to the one where the, the, it has the tower, the tower, um, just the whole speakers. Go back one. Uh, so the picture on the uh, that shows the grills, I, <laughs> the base driver grills. It, it's kind of a funny grill system, right? It's a little unusual to have grills just for the drivers. Yeah. But the but the the grills for the base drivers i got on like 90 degrees wrong <laughs> those are supposed to go on like where, where the sides are you know parallel up and down and it would right. probably look a little bit better like that so like that, that's a screw up on my part um i was but, gonna say it doesn't look right yeah it, no, it, <laughs> it looks a little bit better the other way but i still think it looks a little weird to have the grills just cover the drivers right i think a better solution might have been to like have something cover the entirety of the front yeah you know, i agree baffle, I, but you know Whatever. what? It's still not as ugly as the Perilous and Grills. I'm sorry. I love the Perilous and speakers yeah. from from your reviews, but man, I, I just saw you know Aaron do a review of of the uh, bookshelf like you did, and when he put those grills on, I was like, oh. So they're protected. You know, yeah, those grills though. They they'll like you know they almost bulletproof those Perilous and Grills. Oh, I'm like, sure. I'm yeah, sure they really do the job, but you wouldn't want to. You know, normally don't have a mono, right? So I used to make fun of RBH years ago before you were writing for us because they had a grill that would go on their 1266 tower and it looked just like a maxi pad. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> and I kept making fun. Finally, they, they did away with them. And now they're actually doing some nicer grills. But who cares? Because we're audio hogs. We don't listen to speakers with grills. We only put the grills on if there's kids over and you want to protect the tweeter. That's really what the grills are for. Yeah, exactly. So that's a pretty cool tweeter. It looks like a sawtooth there with the uh, uh, the picture on the right. This is an interesting picture because, like, if you look closely at the tweeter, you see this kind of crosshatch design in the aluminum foil, right? Uh -huh. I guess there's a reason for that, maybe for the pliancy of the uh, ribbon or something, but I thought that was just kind of a cool detail if you get a really close look at that i don't know why they really do that and a lot of a lot of ribbons you use mylar former, so this is actually an aluminum former you were saying, right? Yeah, it's an aluminum diaphragm. Um, so like, you know, it, it's got a very powerful magnet that's controlling it. I mean, you get a magnet anywhere near the front of that like tweeter plate, right? And it'll just pull whatever you have. If it has, oh, you like, mean like a piece of metal? Yeah, it'll pull everything near it. So yeah. that's like, it's a very powerful magnet. Whatever's in that, that um, tweeter is really powerful. Yeah. That's, that's one hell of a woofer, man. It looks almost like a subwoofer driver. That's an expensive one too. The Revelator uh, Eight is like I don't know. It's like maybe Dennis can correct. It's like two or three hundred dollars to buy, like you know, as, as a separate unit, right? So right, it's you know, you can see the. It's just a really big, um, good good woofer. It's also really a. It's got a very soft compliance. So like if you push it in and out with your fingers, it's it's it goes out very easy. You know, so it's like um. It's, it's got kind of a loose suspension, but it, yeah, it's, well, that that probably helps with sensitivity and and yes. for it to be playing low down as well. Absolutely, probably a low f low FS or resonant frequency with a you know decent sensitivity. So you know it's, it seems to be a really good woofer. I mean, and it's important to mention that when you're dealing with a company like Philharmonic, which is really you know is it a one man operation? I don't think he has a bunch of people putting this stuff together. He's probably doing it mostly himself. I think it's a two man operation. I think that the speakers are assembled in a factory in in china and dennis um has a guy who's helping him with the manufacturing on, the, on that end right and he like he designs them a, a factory builds them and ships them to the us uh, so 
I don't know the like the details of the operation, but I think Dennis has helped. He used to be a one man thing, but I think he has. Yeah, well, he, he's in part, the business bottom line though is he's he's making such small quantities of a speaker like this, so obviously he's paying a lot more for drivers than like a, a major brand. Absolutely. But yet he's still putting he's still putting top shelf drivers in a spot in a product that's not that expensive when you think about what's in there. Oh, big time! Yeah, it's a really a it's a very high value product, and especially if you know the the internal, you know the the stuff that's going inside i guess i guess the next slide is the crossover yeah so it's a good crossover right look at that um it's got it's not taking any shortcuts it's not a cheap crossover so for, for I'm, the glad, I'm glad he got the inductor layouts correctly he put them orthogonal to each other i mean you, you'd be surprised how many times i've looked at crossovers and they did not get that right you know yeah i mean that the, it's a very uh thoughtful crossover um you know that doesn't seem to break any rules crossover design that i know of and like nice beefy capacitors air core inductors and resistors so like it's 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 not a you know it's, it's not an inexpensive crossover right there i don't know how much it would have cost to make but it's not so they are they they are 100 volt capacitors so you can't throw a ton of power i wouldn't put a kilowatt on a, on a speaker like this but <laughs> i know yeah uh, there's very few speakers i would put a kilowatt on but <laughs> yeah. but yeah this is it has more than enough dynamic range for most people for sure though it, it can get loud oh wow you you, you know uh, you're doing some nice pictures here man you're the one taking all these pictures. oh i should say i should give credit to dennis okay i've take i took all these pictures except for the crossover that was done that was something dennis gave me that's, that's right. i didn't take that picture oh but this picture is freaking awesome man i should have you do pictures for us because i suck at taking pictures that's like that looks really good so tell me about what's going on here Oh, yeah, this is just kind of prefacing our measurements, which we're going to go into. This is just showing how I measured it. Um, the speaker is uh, set up on a platform, our, our turntable rig, and the, the microphone. You can see that like aluminum tube aiming at the speaker. I have to get the mic away from everything, the speaker away from everything as much as I can. So I get the best measurements that I can. Um, so that's just showing you what, how these things are being measured and how I captured right most of the measurements not all it's a hell of a beautiful day you did it on yeah it's a nice day yeah for sure so this is a, a view a 3d view of the um axial the horizontal responses and right. look there's hardly any and this goes out to 90 degrees and there's hardly any like like a uh, reduction in output at far angles e even at high frequencies which is yeah like, this is a wide dispersion speaker like it, textbook wide oh geez this is yeah very wide without being like an omnipolar speaker you know this is like it, it has a lot of energy even out to 90 degrees so like it's it's wide but and a lot of speakers have wide dispersion but what's uh, important to know is that it maintains this width while being smooth at every angle so like you can have which like, is impressive because it doesn't have a waveguide yeah well yeah it doesn't have a waveguide but i mean all speakers kind of have a waveguide. The waveguide on this is the basically the front baffle is technically waveguide, but this doesn't really have a waveguide, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not using that sort of design, right? So yeah, it's like, and if it did have a waveguide, it wouldn't have this wide of an angle of a response. Right. So like, yeah, so it's just, it's really unusually good. Just like the BMR monitors that we reviewed, I think a year ago or so, maybe I can't remember a year and a half ago. And like, it was just extraordinarily wide and, and, very uniform at all, all angles which is like really important to a wide dispersion loudspeaker this has it's a beautiful so i have to ask about like that 500 500 hertz it looks like a little bump there is that a measurement artifact it looks like maybe it could be diffraction or something in the measurement or do you actually think it's it's some type of resonance in the speaker i think it's a speaker thing i think i i did i like a close mic measurement of the drivers I, I do a lot of measurements we don't publish them all right just yeah yeah them. I do, I do like I do close mic measurements of the drivers and that I did a close mic measurement of the port and I think that's coming from the port. So it's a port resonance. Yeah, but it's so low, it's not. You, it's not audible, right? That's such a little, yeah, little thing, right? It's, you can't it's hear a it. blip. Yeah, yeah it, it, it might be. It might. I think it is, but I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. But you do see the the first port resonance above its tuning frequency is right there. So like, or the first major one is right there. So I think that's from the port. But I, I gotcha. It, it, it's not it's inconsequential it's not it's, right it's, right who cares right it's not it's nothing really and so here you, you see a profile view of the these measurements and uh it's just 
it's beautifully flat. Look at that. It's like it's just nice. It's just hugging a, a you know a line, and it's like there's a, a very slight low end roll off if you go from like down from 25 hertz so that to, I mean 25 kilohertz. Or, or yeah, 25 kilohertz. Uh, not tw no, like 2.5 kilohertz, not 25 kilohertz. Um, yeah, so about 2,500 hertz. It, it seems to go very slightly down in in um level going down from there, but like it's you know that it's just it sounds it's a, it's a linear speaker it's accurate that's what yeah you, it you looks like it. this I yeah mean, you could use this you could use this as a studio monitor if you want i yeah i said i said so in my review you could there's i've measured a lot of studio you know monitors that didn't have this kind of accuracy this is not this is better than most studio monitors so if yeah you, for if sure you're in a studio yeah you could use these to mix and master music and it's going to tell you the truth about whatever you're um recording so this is a Nine, this is out to 90. Our polar map uses, um, you know, color to indicate amplitude. And um, this shows you, like, I, I guess the next slide. I, so th this monitor is such, I mean, this speaker is such a wide dispersion speaker that I need to include a, a wider degree, a wider angle of the uh, polar responses because this is just a flat color, right? This is just, it, it's just telling you that everything as as loud as each other all the way out to the you know the full 90 degrees uh, off axis right so wherever you are this isn't losing output right it sounds the same everything's like a uniform level of loudness so right. to give this picture context i have to pull out to 180 degrees this is the full oh wow yeah the full uh, the circumference of the speaker right so now this shows you how well controlled the uh dispersion is right um I guess some people take issue with my use of the word controlled, right? They say, well, you can't do that. Only waveguides control. Matt would say that. Matt would say, only you know, it's not controlled because there's no waveguides. But I, this is controlled because it's it, it's using the speaker's natural, I mean, the, the driver's natural dispersion to yeah. create an even off-axis response. And uh, it, and it's very, very even, and, and you know, right at like what 80, 90 degrees, it falls right off. So it's 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 beautifully controlled, if you, if you ask me. And uh, so one thing I'd imagine is if with a speaker like this, what you can't do with a narrow dispersion speaker, you could set it up as in a stereo uh, configuration, so someone has a really focused, excellent sweet spot. But no matter where you are in the room, you're still going to have good tonal balance in the speaker. Whereas a narrow dispersion speaker, when you get too far off, off axis you're not going to get that kind of tonal balance, right? That's that's correct. This will have, okay, the, one of the advantages, I mean, there's a lot of advantages of sort of design. One of them is that wherever you are in the room, as long as you're in front of the speaker, anywhere in front of the speaker, it sounds the same, right? With a narrow yeah. dispersion, dispersion speaker, you have to be, and it's like, and it's uh, like I don't know, projected like dispersion uh, area, right? That, that there's, a, there's a much smaller angle you have to be in. But most people, you know, set the speakers back far enough and most people will will be in that so like um i think the biggest advantage to this sort of dispersion pattern is that there is like it, it, it images in such a way in a way that a narrow dispersion speaker can't like it uses like off axis reflections to its advantage to create a more spacious image right mm -hmm. narrow much more so than like narrow dispersion speakers they can image like pinpoint precise, they can create a beautiful sound stage, but the sound stage of this sort of like dispersion, this wide angle, th and the way it uses reflections to its advantage, it's it makes really for a really spacious sound stage that like can benefit a lot of genres of music. Like, um, based, well, I mean, it, it, it's also a matter of preference, but I think it just sounds really nice and enveloping in a way that. I, you don't quite get with narrow dispersion speakers, you know. So but, would you would you treat the sidewalls with a little bit of absorption, or would you basically would. not not do much at all at that point? I, I think if you're in a, a normal room, it kind of already has like stuff on the walls, like maybe bookcases, some art, or and you have like a, you know, like couches and then yep. furniture. It's the, all it's all the treatment you need to the speaker like this. You don't need. I wouldn't. I would use this dispersion to your its advantage to create that. To use the because you'll get a lot, you'll get a much wider sound stage as a yeah, result. Yeah, you should use these reflections to your advantage. Don't absorb them, use them. Yeah, so like this, yeah, you, know, you would want to use these with a, a lot of. And you definitely want to have symmetry in your room. You want to have sidewalls equidistant from each speaker, left and right, in a yeah. like this. Yeah, you would. I, I guess that's a little bit more important for a speaker like this to have 
uh, equal reflections from each speaker, yeah. right? Whereas not, not as critical with like narrow dispersion, but you know, the rewards are you get uh, this nice enveloping sound stage. Well, the other advantage too, because it's an MTM, is you get a more narrow dispersion vertically. So you don't need you don't need to go crazy with floor and ceiling treatments, other than maybe just put you know a throw rug down on the floor with a thick carpet, you know, with a thick pad or something. But by nature, you're limiting to some extent the high frequencies by having an MTM vertically. You, you kind of are, but you know, I've, I've measured a lot of MTMs. It's it it creates a lobing pattern, and it has it it does reduce output in, in some bands down at, at those in, in vertical dispersion, but it, it's kind of uneven. And I don't think it's a really good, unless there, there's ways to do it. And I don't, most MTMs don't. I don't think this is really doing that to like limit vertical dispersion. I, I don't think it's, it's not, that's not really the purpose of the MTM design of this. I might be doing a little bit. I think it's just to achieve kind of like a balance between the, the mids and the yeah, get a little bit more. And the tweeter to have like a lobe to, to have the main main lobe beyond the tweeter, like the to put the focus on the tweeter. On okay, this is the uh, low frequency response, and the, you can see the extension better. I, I do this in a ground plane measurement. Yeah. And um, see the knee of the response kind of like starts rolling off at like your ported, you know, your ported slope at like what, 24 dB per octave, at, and that happens like 25 to 22 hertz. I mean the tuning point frequency of the speaker is 22 hertz so this will give you a good strong response in room down to 20 hertz you know with with room gain you're you're going to get 20 hertz base with this so like um you don't need a sub you know if, if, add a sub if you want more if you want more output right but it's not, you're not going to get much more extension yeah and it's not really a fourth order response it's a little shallower than that too yeah. which is good which is good for room gain so if you look at like 30 hertz versus 15 hertz it's really not 24 db per octave yeah i mean i wouldn't add a sub to the speaker because it's so competent and, and then you have to go through the you have to go through the trouble of kind of calibrating the sub and like integrating it in the, in, with a speaker like yep. this like why it, it, the base is already really good this is a depiction of the uh vertical responses and like you can see, I mean, that, that MTM, it does chop things up as you go a little bit off axis on the vertical response. You can mm -hmm. see the ten, zero and 10 degrees above are really beautifully nice flat responses. But then you start getting like um, lobes um, above and below that point. That's so, pretty normal though for an MTM. Yeah, it is. And like, so this, this is a speaker you really want to be listening on axis, like, at maybe a little bit above the, the response isn't really effect, affected at much like 10 degrees so like you want to be listening roughly on, on the level of the tweeter yeah you want your you want your seated ear level position to be on axis with the tweeter sure you probably this speaker is probably a little bit better to do that than the normal speakers this speaker needs that a little bit more and so like that's that's why i'm posting this, this is a speaker you want to be listening on with the tweeter at your level that's the point of this this slide and the response does get chopped up a bit when you when you go up and down from that angle still not bad though that looks because i if you look at just an mt just a mid tweeter and you go vertically above the tweeter axis and below the tweeter axis you get more variance than this i've seen it yeah you can get yeah you can you could get some really massive um holes especially with like low order uh crossover slopes mm -hmm. you know like 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 a second order right can make some really a first order if you're crazy right you're going to have some really <laughs> massive holes, the lobes, the, like the, the nulls, and, and the, uh, the crossword cancellation can turn into huge gaps. But this, it's still pretty good. It'll sound good. You know, those other slopes will sound fine. Okay, yep. this uh, is just the grill differences, Oof. right? So, so, yeah, I mean, I, that, I mean, it probably looks worse than it sounds, but this kind of illustrates a point. Most speakers don't. Don't use grills for most speakers. This is, don't this use the grills. You, you the get grills. a speaker that measures incredibly well like this, and then you go and put a grill on it. And I know there's people out there that actually ask, because they still ask, should I leave the grills on or off? The answer is always leave them off, unless, you have, <laughs> unless you're worried about someone coming and poking your tweeter. Take the grills off. You know, the, the engineer went through painstaking uh, effort to give you this linear response, and don't, you know, yeah, the grills skirt only it. Don't only protect it. Don't have them off. You don't need them. But I should say that the kind of effects that this is having, this is a diffraction effect. Diffraction effect changes in frequency um, 
and, and severity depending on the angle that you're listening to it at yeah. and and so like that would that you wouldn't hear that that would get like shuffled around all the, the dips and the peaks there would get shuffled around the frequency and, and in room it wouldn't sound like that it wouldn't it, it's a diffraction effect so it's gonna it's gonna go it's gonna change so much depending on the angle that in the room it's gonna sum up and it's, it's not gonna look sound anywhere near that bad so yeah i got you you shouldn't use them but okay this is yeah that, that, that that's basically all the, the major measurements i had to show and <laughs> is that your dog uh not it's not my dog it's a dog who just really is kind of all needs needs to be the center of attention and gets upset when it's not right so oh, yeah okay. that that's that dog is just a real prima donna you know you might yeah, say he's an audiophile <laughs> obviously he's hanging around listening to the speakers you can say a good test yeah a good taste in uh in speakers yeah so the dog i just had to end the dog just wouldn't move i was taking pictures the dog came down there and wouldn't move and so fine you want to be the star okay fine go ahead and do it. I'll, I'll take a picture and that one came out pretty good so i just kept it in there awesome yeah. well it's a great review guys don't forget to check out our homepage audiohawks.com you can see the entire review there and i guess we'll just kind of look through the comments here i see dennis is is here as well there's a lot of comments let's see so let me ask you this now from memory i know it's hard to do that um is it worth the upgrade going from the bmr bookshelf to the tower or do you would you rather have the bmr bookshelf with a pair of subs or is it good enough to get the tower, save yourself money and save yourself a headache of integrating subs if you just want to set up a two channel system for a narrow listening area just to enjoy, you know, music? I would say that the the monitors, like as far as sound quality goes, the monitors are like the bookshelf speaker. The bookshelf speakers are like these towers. So like mm -hmm. the the difference is mainly um, the the towers have a little bit more extension and they have more dynamic range. So if you have a larger room, go with the towers. But if your room isn't like it's a medium to small room, go with the monitors. One advantage I'll give to the monitors, since the towers kind of, you want to be listening to them on on a height equal around the tweeter, right? Well, with the, the towers, that's a fixed height, right? You can't really change that. Mm -hmm. But with the monitors, you can by just, you know, having different, adjusting the height of your bookshelf speaker stand. So like the monitors have more flexibility that you can use whatever book shelf speaker stand you, or whatever the amount you want to get that on ear level. So like, um, that's one advantage in the monitor's favor. But like, aside from that, they don't. You know, it's smaller, right? That's like nice. It's lighter to deal with, right? But the towers really, if you want the more dynamic range, uh, the towers are the one to get. Um, I should because they have double the mid range drives. Also the uh, the Tweeter is upgraded from the one that we reviewed in the, the monitor that RAL tw Tweeter supposedly has less distortion at higher levels. Hmm. And the, that you know larger woofer, it's it's a matter of dynamic range, really. So like that's that's why I would get the, the tower speaker. That's so a bunch of people are asking how does it compare to a Revel? And I would you know, someone's asking Salon and Performa BE. These are much more expensive speakers. The yeah. Salon Salon two, it's our 18 grand a pair or 20 grand, no, 21 grand a pair. The 328 BEs are 18 or 16 grand a pair. I don't even remember, somewhere around there. So totally different price class. Obviously, those speakers, you know, they play louder. That's for one sure. thing. They will, for sure. The Salon two probably has more bass with triple eights. Um, but I would imagine that this speaker has a lot of the virtues of a Revel for a lot cheaper. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I think maybe. Uh, it depends on uh, the Revels, your uh, the very particular speakers you're comparing them to. Um, like I, I reviewed the uh, BE, the Performa BE F226 BE towers. Those are really, really good speakers. W would I say those are better than these, even though they cost quite a bit more? I would say maybe they have a little bit better build quality, right? They're they're like a they they have more substantial cabinet. Uh, they have uh, might have more a little bit more dynamic range. Uh, is there, but as far as sound quality goes, I can't. I don't. Uh, maybe they sound a little bit different. Those are, aren't quite as wide. They'll have a different sound character, and that might be more of a matter of taste. They're both really good, but I don't know that I'd get those over the DMR towers. 
I don't. Th that's a statement right there. The fact that you're even comparing this speaker to a Revel that's much more expensive, and your and Revels are already pretty good value to begin with. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a comment here that's basically saying Dennis is almost at cost. He's basically giving away his expertise for free. I mean, I would kind of agree with that. Looking at the parts quality in here, you know, Steve Feinstein wrote an article recently for us about the cost of products. I don't know if you read that. But when you look at a speaker and you look at the parts that are in there, this, the parts are like, what, less than 10% of the cost of the retail of the speaker. This is the opposite model in what Dennis is doing. He's not going to become rich off of, of selling these speakers, that's for sure. But you know what? In, Den in uh, Philharmonics, like, one thing they're doing to like that, that saves them expense that normal speak comp loudspeaker manufacturers don't really ha have the luxury of dealing of having to omit is the expense of marketing. But Dennis, I mean, I mean, the Philharmonic does not spend any hardly any money on marketing. The, like the this Capital Audio Fest, right? That's probably their entire like marketing budget. Yeah. And, and the cost of shipping these speakers to us, right, for a review. That's it. That was their entire marketing budget, right? They don't yep. have any. They're not spending a penny on it. I mean, outside of that, on advertising. So like that's a huge. And they don't have you know, they they're very direct. You know consumer direct brand more so than even other of these so-called manufacturer direct like in, or internet direct brands right that this is almost as close as it gets you know it's a guy and he's getting the speakers ma manufactured and he's just selling them he's not there's no middleman there's no middleman mm -hmm. in this company so like yeah so they can cut all those costs so like it's just a really good buy but the thing is uh, uh, like the cost of that is now it's you have to know about them right so they're yeah. kind of like uh, it's you have to be in the know to get speakers this good right for the that cost and that's but he's selling all of them so like you know it does it does not it's not a problem for him the word of mouth really works here in, in this case well especially since we cover it people are going to find out about it for sure so we got a shout out to you james uh exceptional work amazing dedication you guys need to be one of those live chats with the rendell sound speakers didn't we do one? I, yeah, I, we did do one. We probably should do one on the subs. I don't think we did one on those. We we're did probably... on, on we did we did cover that sub and that three way sub kind of comparison thing we did like a month oh, ago. Oh yeah, now. that's right. The 1723 2V or something. Yeah. I, I actually I'm re right now I'm reviewing two of their subs, the 1961 1S and 1961 1V sub. So maybe we can deal with that when we get to the when those are that review is published, you know. No, the rental sound speakers are really good. They're truly good yeah. speakers. That, that's where you know, been. we're in a pretty remarkable age right now. I know there's a, a lot of crap going on with the supply chain issues and, you know, because of COVID and everything else. But my God, man, loudspeaker quality has gone so far up in the last five or eight years. I, I don't know if you've noticed that trend as well, but look at the stuff we're reviewing now compared to what we were doing a decade ago and how we're getting speakers at, you know, a couple of thousand dollars a pair that are giving you state-of-the-art measurements like you're, you're showing here that you couldn't get that 15, 10, 15 years ago, not at those prices. Yeah, um, I think that there's a demand now. Like, I think that in a sense, like, you know, we, we are a kind of objectivist, like, you know, uh, magazine, right? Audioholics, right? And I think that kind of philosophy has spread more. So now that there's a, there's a greater demand for speakers that are accurate, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's just there because I think we helped kind of get that word out. We and, and several other other like organizations, you know, helped to get the word out that here's here's a really good target to shoot for in loudspeaker yeah. manufacturing. So like, um, now we are getting there's a lot of really good, uh, you know, wait till you see like what. Some of the the stuff that that's coming down the pipe, it's like really good for the money. Holy cow! Wow. So much. So yeah, much like those stuff. new those new mono price speakers look pretty awesome. Those bookshelf speakers. I don't know if you got those. The Encore series. Um, we're getting yeah. them. I haven't got them yet. I don't. I mean, we'll we'll see. Hopefully, they're good. I think I expect that they will be. But you know, we haven't. I haven't measured them yet, so I don't know for sure. Right. I think they. So keep your fingers crossed. You know, I I think they'll be good, but I don't want to say anything. You know to you know to jinx it right <laughs> well, well just to give you guys uh an update on site news um we're currently working on the 2021 uh product of the year awards normally we post those around december you know first or second probably second week of december but 
might come a little early this year. I'm trying to get this thing out early so it helps people, um, you know, plan ahead because it takes longer to get pr products now. So it gives you guys a good buying guide to get the very best of the products that we reviewed in 2021. And I got to thank you, James, personally, because you're doing 98% of our loudspeaker reviews right now. And we're trusting your ears and your measurements. Of course, I followed your advice when I built the Audiolic Smart House and I put the Paradigm uh, Premier 800Fs in my family room. And I'm dazzled every day by that system. I've got the whole Paradigm system with the Elite 80 Rs in the ceiling and the A's, the ones that are angled for surround and the JL Audio in-wall subs. And that system is just phenomenal. Like I just did not expect it to be that good. And basically, you know, following our guidelines on what measures good usually will sound good. And we, cause we know the right measurements that are responsible for good sound. So keep the snake oil to the minimum and, you know, look for the performance in audio. And that's what we're all about. And, you know, James, you're a huge uh, help in pursuing that goal with us. And I appreciate that. And everybody here appreciates that as well. I'll just hopefully I'll just keep it coming. You know, I, I, I'm getting products in for review, you know, I'll just keep plugging away <laughs> just seeing what works and what doesn't, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the goal. Well, again, guys, the review is the Philharmonic BMR tower. I would definitely check these out. If you're looking for an audiophile grade speaker with an incredible finish and really nice build quality, honest to good measurements, good performance, and an incredible value. If you're setting up a two channel system, I know if I was setting up just a small space for two channel, maybe have a turntable and an SACD player and a nice integrated amp, I would be looking very strongly at getting a pair of these towers. I mean, I just, it's kind of a no brainer, especially that it has real bass extension. You don't have to worry about adding a subwoofer to do, you know, because sometimes that's difficult to get good integration between a pair of speakers and a sub, especially if you don't have the tools to do measurements and be able to analyze and be able to time align things. This is really one hell of a, a performance package here and it looks great. And how many finishes do they offer? Like that's a nice finish that you have, but can you get different finishes or is it just available maybe in like that finish in black or white or what's the deal with the finish options? I think it's just that, um, is it a rosewood or something like that? And black and maybe white, I think. Dennis, maybe he can answer that because I, <laughs> I have so many specs in my head. I can't remember every single spec for every single speaker, but I, I, I'm so, sure. The so we one. have a link. We have a link in the review to his website, and I'm sure if you guys are interested in the product, you can ask him that question. All I ask is you guys just mention Audio Hawks. That way, they he knows that you came from us, and you know it's always appreciated when manufacturers get feedback that they're hearing about products through us, and it's always you know keeps us going, keeps us getting more products to review. And oh, here's another one on great work on James and Gene on the Monoprice 16 inch THX sub. Yeah, James, I give my hats off to you that you had to move that giant beast of a sub around to do measurements on it because that thing was probably almost 200 pounds, right? Yeah, it was 170 something pounds. It was see, um... we're trying, we're trying to bulk you up, man. You got to start doing some deadlifts, you got to do some, uh, you know, some squats and lunges. That way, you you know, when you get these subwoofers in house, it's not that big of a deal to carry them up and down <sighs> the steps. You try it, Gene. You you <laughs> yeah. do it, you, and then so look at look at this way. No. I did it, I did it for 20 years, man. I oh, moved wait. 300 pound speakers, those RBHs up my steps, oh, yeah. and that's part of the reason why my back is effed up right now. <laughs> I had to carry these like like that picture and the slideshow with the 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 tower speaker on that on the top of that ladder structure. I had to carry those speakers up up that ladder structure without getting a scuff on that pristine finish. It's not wow. easy. It's not easy. So yeah. Dennis just commented he's the designer for Philharmonic. He he offers you rosewood and piano black. Um, so those are your two options right now. He tried white, couldn't get that to work. I really like the rosewood. Piano black is great if you don't mind light reflections in a room. If you don't have a TV going and you don't want to see that, um, that's the problem with piano black. I've got piano black in my theater room and my speakers, and I can see every little reflection, and I'm kind of regretting that decision. But, you know, both of these finishes would be awesome in a two channel room. So that's really cool. You know, black and like there's so many speakers that come into black and then some kind of real wood, you know, veneer. I would like to see something and like a little bit more 
daring of a color, like say. You mean like the Ferrari red RBH is? Yeah, right? red, blue, yellow, orange. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a lot of cool colors out there. Let's get a little of uh, I actually requested the red. I thought it'd be cool to have a red speaker up here, and it was cool that they built that. So that does look pretty cool. Yeah, it, that's a cool it one. looks yeah, it looks really great, especially in person. I can't wait to do like a virtual press event for RBH when they get their act together and getting their website all up to oh, date. But sure. so that's it. Um, James, appreciate you coming here, talking about the Philharmonic BMR Tower. Again, I'll put a link in the description below for the written review. I really encourage you guys to read the review. I know we're in an era now where everybody just wants to do YouTube videos, but James puts lots of efforts into really describing the sound of the products that he reviews in his listening test. So even if you don't want to look at the measurements because it geeks out too much, his subjective impressions of speakers really puts you, it paints a really vivid picture of what he's hearing. And it's very valuable for people that want to know how a speaker performs. Um, so I definitely check, recommend you guys check that out. And don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. Don't forget for our fellow patrons that uh, next week on Tuesday at 9 p.m., I'm going to be doing a one-hour private session for our patrons where we'll answer any questions you want. So put that on your calendars. I'll put a reminder on our Patreon channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the like. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>